The secret behind secret societies. Obviously, the secret behind secret societies is a secret that people don't want to spread abroad. And uh, this particular topic is so serious that I will venture rather to say nothing, very little. But I'd rather let history and the quotes speak for themselves. So it might become tedious to see quote after quote after quote, but the fact of the matter is, then it's not me saying it, it's historic facts being put before you, and then you decide for yourself whether the picture makes sense or whether it doesn't make sense. Revelation 17, 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colors, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having the golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. There's only one church in the whole world that uses a woman with a cup, and that is the Roman church. And uh, here is City, Citta del Vaticano, using the woman with the golden cup, and she is called Fides on all their documents. Fides. Now what does that mean, Fides? Well, let's go to a Masonic source, a very good Masonic source, written by Albert G. Mackey, the Manual of the Lodge. Albert Mackey was a 33-degree Freemason. It'll become clear as we go through the lectures what this means, and he says, the right hand has in all ages been deemed an emblem of fidelity, and our ancient brethren worshipped deity under the name of fides, or fidelity, which was sometimes represented by two right hands joined, and sometimes by two human figures holding each other by the right hand. Numa was the first who erected the altar to fides, under which the name, the goddess of oaths and honesty, was worshipped. So it means honesty and fidelity, but it is also an image of a female deity. Now, Revelation 17 verse 5 calls this institution the mother of prostitutes. In Revelation 18 verse 7, she says, I sit as queen, I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. So she might have lost some children during the Reformation, but she's going to get them back. I am, and there is none beside me, I will never be a widow or suffer loss of children. She's going to control the world in a spiritual sense. That's what this power says. Now it's interesting that the Vatican has just recently, September 5, 2000, issued this encyclical, Dominus I Jesus, where she says, Other churches are no sisters of ours, the Vatican insists. It must always be clear that the one holy Catholic and apostolic universal church is not the sister but the mother of all the churches. Cardinal Ratzinger said that. He's the head of the Inquisition. They don't call themselves the Inquisition anymore. They call themselves the Congregation for Doctrine and Faith. But it's the same thing. It's even in the same building. Now, she's not the mother. She is not the sister but the mother of all the churches. That means all the other churches are subject to her, right or wrong. That's what she says. Now in Revelation 13, verse 1 and 2, speaking about the same power, it says, And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now that's a very, wow, <laughs> statement. The dragon gave him the power? In other words, this power comes from another source. Now doesn't Catholicism preach Christianity? Yes, it does. Doesn't it preach Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world? Yes, it does. But it also preaches mediation through other mechanisms and through the church. Now, it is interesting that in secret societies there are always two doctrines. One for the initiated and one for the goyim, the uninitiated. And the Knights Templars had two doctrines. The one was the inside esoteric occult doctrine, and the other one was the exoteric, the one to the outside, and that was Catholicism. So the masses received a religion which the insiders turned on its head. Amongst occult insiders, 
Lucifer is the true son of God. Jesus is a second son who was defeated by the first one who had been thrown out. So Lucifer is the true luminary, the victor in the battle, and will be the one who will be worshipped at the end of time. That is occult doctrine. That's always been the doctrine of the Kabbalah, the Kabbalist doctrine, and it has been the doctrine of Gnosticism. But of course, it's not what the Bible teaches, but then Catholicism doesn't teach what the Bible teaches either. Revelation 17, verses 12 to 14, talks about ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. And they will make war against the Lamb. But the Lamb will overcome them because he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Now we're going to deal with the whole chapter of Revelation 17 at a later stage. But the kings of the world, here represented by these ten, will give their power to the system, just like in the Middle Ages, and enforce the doctrines on an entire world. Very interesting. This will be this beast from the bottomless pit. Now, Gary H. Carr, in his work with, on route to global occupation, puts it this way. He says there were the ancient mystery religions, which come from Babylon, and uh, they were pantheistic, of course, which means God is in nature, God is in everything, which in, in effect makes us God then too. This was inculcated in Kabbalism, was taken over in the Christian era in what is called Gnosticism, and the Knights Templars were the inner secret core that had the ancient knowledge of the mystics. This was carried further through Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry and the Illuminati, which according to Gary Carr controls Marxism, American European secret societies and political societies, international banking, and the World Council of Churches. Now that sounds very strange. Is the World Council of Churches controlled by Freemasonry? We'll have to look into that in some detail. Then of course you have the entire New Age movement, the Theosophical Societies, the many cults, and all these things are all controlled by this mechanism to make null and void the doctrine of salvation in Christ alone. That will be the final battle. And in order to achieve this, this woman has concealed herself and has hid herself in a garb of Christianity. And people receive the Goyim doctrine and do not know what the inner core doctrine is. That is quite something. Well, if we look at 1 Chronicles 16, verse 26, for all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens, tells us that idolatry is quite something that's rife on the earth. And uh, Nimrod, the Lord of heaven, Tammuz, the pagan Messiah, and Semiramis, the queen of heaven, these are find their origin in Babylon. And if you go through all the religions, they were, that were propagated in Lebanon, Phoenicia, Babylon, Assyria, Greece, Rome, Egypt, India, China, Mexico, Scandinavia, you have only this same picture under different names. Baal, Tammuz, Ashtoreth, El, Bacchus, Astarte, Belus, Tammuz, Ria, Ishtar, Ninus, Hercules, Beltus, etc., etc., in Egypt, Ra, Osiris, or Horus, Isis, Hathor, India, Vishnu, Krishna, Isi, or Devaki, and so on, and so on. Now, Romanism, the Roman Church, has taken this trinity and made it father, mother, child, which means that they must elevate the female to the point of deity, and we'll see how they did that and how they are doing that with the sanction of the Pope. So the true trinity and the Roman Catholic trinity are two different things. For the Goyim, it's father, son, and Holy Spirit, for the inner circle, it's father, mother, child, which is none other than Baal, Tammuz, and Ashtoreth, if you want to take it back to those times. Jupiter is the god who is worshipped under Petros, 
the rock. And uh, Ubi Petri, where Peter is, there is the church. So here's another rock which takes the place of the true rock. Christianity and the secret societies, we could just summarize it as follows. The old Babylonian religion gave rise to Kabbalism. Via the Essenes and others, Gnosticism came into existence, and Gnosticism was founded by Simon Magus. This comes from no other source than History of the Magi and uh, by Eliphas Levi. Wow, that's a high Masonic source. So Gnosticism founded by Simon Magus. Then this Gnosticism, with its secret doctrine, was eventually, over time, through many intermediary organizations, carried over to the Knights Templars. And the Knights Templars were a group of a, a Roman Catholic order, if you like, that were set over the temple site to protect it. And they had strong links to Islamic societies, the Ismailis, the Karmatites, the Fatimites, the Druzes, and the Assassins. And these are very, very interesting, and we'll be dealing with them when we talk about the Islamic connection, what the secret societies actually teach. Just like the Templars had two doctrines, one for the Goyim, the uninitiated, and one for the insiders, and the two diametrically opposed to each other, so the secret societies of Islam do exactly the same thing. But that's another lecture. Now the Templars, they had their secret inner information inculcated in the Rosicrucians and the Jesuits. The Jesuits, again, formed and created Freemasonry. And Freemasonry was created as the Protestant arm of the Roman Catholic Church. Unbeknown to them, beguiled, fooled, if you like, into doing the work that Rome wanted them to do, so that Rome could sit in the background while Freemasonry did it for them. And then it wasn't them, it was them. And it was mainly Protestants they were doing it, and not Rome. Very clever. Very, very clever indeed. So now let's have a look at these Knights Templars. Here are some of the presentations, representations. This is De Malloy, uh, the founder of the, or not the founder, but uh, the leader at the time of its uh, dissolution of the Knights Templars. This is what their dress looked like, if you like. And that is one of their symbols. It is a symbol that is used by many churches today. Did you know that? Many charismatic churches use that symbol. That's fascinating. And uh, Jehovah's Witnesses use that symbol as well. We'll come to that in another lecture. Now let's have a look at what Nesta Webster, Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, has to say about the Templars. We're not going to read it all, but uh, you can always, if you get the video, stop the quote. In the year 1118, 19 years after the First Crusade ended with the defeat of the Muslims, the capture of Antioch and Jerusalem, these groups were founded that were eventually established as the Templars, and they presented them with a house near the site of the Temple of Solomon, hence their name, Knights Templars. And they became very famous and a very powerful order which controlled all the finances, the financial world. They were the banking elite of the world, if you like. And then in the, in the year 1128, the order was sanctioned by the Council of Troyes and by the Pope. It was a Roman Catholic order within the church. Now, some years later, October 13, 1307, this order was officially brought to an end by the King of France because it had come to light what they were doing, so it was said. The King of France, Philippe le Bel, had the Templars arrested, and the date was Friday the 13th, October 1307, and since that day, Friday the 13th is a day of bad luck for the entire world. And the charges brought against them were, the ceremony of initiation into the order was accomplished by insults to the cross and the denial of Christ and gross obscenities. 
gross obscenities. There were all kinds of things reminiscent of Sodom that had to take place there. The adoration of an idol, which was said to be the image of the true God, and that was Baphomet, the symbol over here, of the androgenic male-female deity. The omission of the words of the consecration of the Mass, the right that to lay chiefs amongst themselves, giving absolution, and authorization of unnatural vice. So they had to, to curse the cross, trample upon Jesus, swear allegiance to Baphomet, and sanction this with unusual vice. It's a pretty serious crime in those days, so he was sentenced to death. But the order actually didn't disappear. The Pope was very reluctant to say that it was so. Masonic ritual includes references to the Knights Templars. For example here, Secret Societies and Subnervous Movements says, Several knights who had set forth the rescue of the holy places of Palestine from the Saracens formed an association under the name of Freemasons thus indicating that their principal desire was the re reconstruction of the Temple of Solomon. And you hear a lot about the reconstruction of the Temple of Solomon today, and the story of Israel and all those interesting things. Now let's go a little bit into some of the history. I'm taking you to this beautiful palace. Where do you think it is? It's in Jerusalem. And it's Notre Dame Vatican. And this is where the Pope has his representation in Jerusalem. It's a palace for a king. There's the Vatican flag flying outside. And uh, there's even a whole lane where you have some interesting papal artifacts. Now in Jerusalem, I went to look up the site of the knights. And here is the knights' palace, the Latin patriarch. This is where the knights' templars originally had a site, and the knights of the papacy now control this area. This is their symbol that they use. That is also the knight's shield, which is used by many religions today. The Rema Church uses that symbol, for example. These are uh, the eternal warriors. That is the symbol that they use. There they are being, they kiss the Pope or the Patriarch's uh, ring, they are knighted just like knights, and they knight highly prominent bankers and individuals such as that. Inside this church, you have, of course, the statue of Jupiter as Peter. Notice that the foot is well kissed. And uh, I, I didn't want to kiss the foot, so I just stood there. And it is a very important church because both Pope Paul VI and Pope John Paul II visited this church, which is, of course, highly symbolic, and there are the plaques, and uh, the Latin Patriarch, the Knight's Palace. If you go inside, there's this interesting altar, and as you look at the altar, you'll see certain figures over here. This one over here is very interesting. Let me get a little bit closer, and what do you see? You see the double-headed eagle, which is also the symbol that is used in Freemasonry. So there it is on the altar of the knights. And what is there on this side? Two swords held like a compass. Fascinating. So there are many, many Masonic fig figures in here. Uh, the tail feathers and the feathers of the eagle, very reminiscent of what you have, for example, on the back of the dollar and all those other interesting symbols of the circle with the triangle and the sun around it. And... Uh, the inheritor of the Templar uh, nuance are the Jesuits. Now the Jesuits, of course, are the ones who behind the scenes control many things. They were founded on the 15th of August, 1534, by Ignatius Loyola and were sanctioned by the Pope on the 27th of September, 1540. So they were created, as it were, to stand against the Reformation. They were designed to destroy the Reformation. Loyola wanted the order to be champions of Catholic unity, and, uh, of course, submission to Christ's vicar, the Pope, was absolutely essential. Here you have the institution of Loyola's organization by the Pope uh, on this particular day, and there are some interesting 
analogies which we will find here. Here, for example, there is considerable analogy between Masonic and Jesuitic degrees. And the Jesuits also tread down the shoe and bare the knee because Ignatius Loyola thus presented himself at Rome and asked for the confirmation of the order. Now, everything I say has a quote attached to it, so don't say I said it. And if anybody wants to get angry about anything that is said, then phone the people that said it, say, said it and be angry with them. Okay? So this is what they did, and this is what Freemasonry does. So there you have your, your nice little link. Now, who existed first? Freemasons or the Jesuits? The Jesuits existed first, of course. They were to obey as a corpse, peripe a cadaver, the reconstitutions repeat 500 times that one must see Christ in the person of the general, and even if God gave you a dog, you must obey him as though he were Jesus Christ himself. Loyola's statue in a Jesuit retreat, Loyola in vision, the Society of Jesus constituted in the chapel Notre Dame, Notre Mer, 1534, now the chapel of the Sacred Heart in Paris. Many, many occult encrustations, and this is the famous Jesuit oath that each Jesuit makes when he becomes a Jesuit. Now, it'll tell us something about the character of the Jesuits. There it says, I, and he fills in his name, in the presence of God and all the saints and all these things, swear that His Holiness, the Pope, is Christ's vice-regent and is the true and only head of the Catholic Universal Church, etc. It also says here, that this power was given by the Saviour, Jesus Christ. He has power to dispose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, governments, all being illegal without his sacred confirmation and that they may safely be destroyed. So a Jesuit swears that if a government is not subject to Rome, it can be what? Destroyed. I further declare that uh, I will help and assist and advise all or any of His Holiness's agents uh, wherever I shall be, and do my utmost to extirpate the heretical Protestant or liberal doctrines. Liberal doctrines are doctrines where you decide what you believe, you take the liberty of making your own choice rather than allowing the Pope to do it for you, and that will be destroyed and all their pretended powers. And that it doesn't matter where you send me in the world, I will obey, and I promise that I will have no opinion of my own, I will obey like a corpse, and I will make war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth. I will spare neither sex, age, nor condition, and I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women, crush their infants' heads against the wall, in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. That's a pride, quite a nice Christian promise, would you agree? Very Christian promise. Did they do it? Well, the Valdenses, they smashed the children's heads against the rocks to make the parents rescind. In the Ottoman Empire, that's an interesting story, in Serbia and in uh, all those East Bloc countries where they occupied, they took the children, threw them in the air, and caught them on the ends of their bayonets. They were, they were nice people. Now you'll say, that was Islam, that wasn't Jesuits? Well, debatable. We'll talk about it another time. And uh, if I cannot do it openly, I will do it secretly. So that is what a Jesuit swears. This is the famous pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, the most prestigious Catholic university in the world. The Jesuits in all their enclaves, have their figures in caves. Now, in paganism, all the deities come out of the cave, and they have the letters IHS, which actually stand for Isis Horus Set, which is the Egyptian trinity. They, of course, they'll say it means Jesus hominum salvator, Jesus the saviour of men, but it doesn't. It means IHS, Isis Horus Set. And their symbol is the triangle with the all-seeing eye, in it for this deity. They also use the pillar, uh, the stella, if you like. They have the symbol of the triangle with the eye in a circle, which is also the symbol used in the New Age movement. And we saw 
that Gary Carr says that Freemasonry controls the New Age movement and the Jesuits control the Freemasonry or created it. This is the uh, University of the Jesuits in Prague. On top of it they have Atlas, not Jesus Christ. If you go to a more modern Jesuit enclave like this one in Germany, I visited this. I'm quite cheeky sometimes, there I am. And took a picture and inside they have this picture of Christ. This is not Christ, this is Atlas holding the world on top of his shoulders, disguised. They have these symbols up against the wall. There, this symbol is the symbol of Hermes. If you take away uh, the cross, then you have the symbol of Isis. This is paganism at its best. And these symbols over here are nothing. Here it is, Jesuit Kirche, when it was built, etc., and their symbolism, Maria, the M is the Masonic M, the triangle, Ria, the goddess. Here is a, a church in Germany, a cathedral. Inside you will see the circle with a cross in it, the crossed swords, symbol of all symbols used also in Freemasonry. Now if you go back to ancient Assyria, that was a very prominent cross. It was the Maltese cross. It comes from ancient paganism. They have the symbols of uh, the, the star over here, two stars, one over the other, or two crosses, one over the other. They have the compass, they have the moon with a disc in it or a star in it, which is the symbol that Islam uses, for example. They have the solar calendar and the triple crown. All of these are used by the papacy. Upside-down crosses represent victory over Christ. Hammers and compasses and sickles, these are symbols that are prevalent in the world. There's Jesus standing above the skull and crossbones, which is a symbol of Jupiter, the god Jupiter, uh, who is a symbol, of course, who is Lucifer. Upside down crosses again. This is a very uh, important cathedral in Europe, in Germany, where all the political leaders come together. If you go there, you will have Janus, the two-headed one, and then you have the statue so-called of David, but of course it isn't David, it is the god Pan, because he has a pan flute in his hand, and David didn't play a pan flute. So I went to look for the dark side of Pan, because there's a light side and a dark side, and I found them, there he is, the hoofed one in the same cathedral. So they hide their occult symbolism. If you enter into the hallway, you find this over here, this is the god Anubis. It's got nothing to do with Christianity, there you have him as well, plus you have the phoenix rising from the ashes, plus you have the symbol of Jupiter, and a whole host of other symbols over there, and in their side chapel you have all the signs of the zodiac serving the various deities like Mars and Aquarius, etc., and the doorknob is a yin-yang. This has nothing to do with Christianity. They use the symbol of the compass, and uh, Jupiter, and the PX symbol over there, which you will find in virtually every single Christian denomination upon the face of the earth. The phoenix rising from the ashes, the peacock, all symbols of Lucifer. Here you have the PX with a circle with a dot in it, and you say to yourself, but isn't that a symbol of Christianity? No, this is a symbol of Horus. This has got nothing to do with Christianity. They use pine cones. Let's ask Albert Mackey, 33 degree Freemason, to tell us what the symbol means. The point within the circle is an interesting and important symbol in Freemasonry. The symbol is really a beautiful but somewhat obtrusive allusion to the old sun worship and introduces us for the first time to that modification of it among the ancients, the worship of the phallus. So it's a pretty filthy symbol at that. It deals with male organs. Wow. So that comes from the horse's mouth. So that's what it means. Now what's the PX mean? Let's go to the best Masonic source in the world, Morals and Dogma, page 292. And in case you don't believe me, I photocopied it so that you can see it. There you can see the symbol. Can you see that? It is the staff of Osiris. This is straight from the horse's mouth. You can't get a better source than this. This is the highest Freemason who founded the Scottish Rite 33 uh, higher degrees and was what, no, he didn't found them, but he, he, he uh, officiated over them. On the Medal of Constantinopolis, in hoc signat, eris, whatever, inscriptions. And then some other interesting things. So this is the staff of Osiris. 
And then he goes through the mystic Tao and the crosses and the uh, stars of David, and then he uses this one as well. Interesting symbol. He says the vestment of the priest of Horus were covered with these crosses. That's a Maltese cross. Remember that I showed it to you on the Syrian king? Now who wears that on his vestments? Well, let's have a look. Oops, there it is. Who's wearing it? The Pope is wearing it. So what is he? He must be the priest of Horus. So to the outside world, it seems like Christianity, but to the inner circle, it's occultism. On the floor of the, the cathedral in London, you have the tricale, which is the triple yang, yin yang. And what does that mean? Well, let's go and ask the sources themselves. Celtic version of the yin yang. That's what it is. The tricale, the sea, good luck, cauldron, Celtic goddess, the goddess of wisdom and witchcraft. Who was enthroned in the French Revolution? Goddess of reason, witchcraft, reason, all these things, same deity. On the floor of the same cathedral you find the mystic Tao. What does the Tao represent? Let's ask another mason, Ward. He says it's the symbol of the male creative side of the deity, sign language of the mysteries. So again, it has a sexual connotation. What's it doing on the floor of a cathedral? So the Jesuits are the heirs of the occult religion, and they control the world through their agencies. They stand in the background, create sub-organizations, and everybody thinks they are not active. Let's ask them themselves what they believe. Here is the history of the general of the Society of Jesus. These are all the generals, starting with Ignatius Loyola, they're all listed down there. We don't have to go through them all. All the way through to uh, the present one that rules now, whose name is Peter Hans Kolvenbach. Nice German name. It's interesting that the Germans are very prominent in this. Peter Hans Kolvenbach is the head of the, of the Jesuits. Cardinal Ratzinger, another German, is the head of the Inquisition. They seem to be pretty much in control. What does he look like? There he is, Peter Hans Kolvenbach. You're looking probably at one of the mightiest men on the earth today, if not the mightiest. He's the Black Pope. Here you have the cave of Loyola. Here you have George W. Bush and the Pope uh, in audience with each other. And they don't do anything in s by chance. They just happen to do this exactly under that picture I showed you, where Loyola receives his commission from the Pope. Now, the ceremony of induction and the extreme oath of the Jesuits. Library of Congress, Catholic card, there it is. You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces and states that were at peace and incite them to deeds of blood involving them in war with each other and to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous cultivating the art and the sciences and enjoying the blessings of peace, to take sides with the combatants and to act uh, secretly in contact with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that with which you might be connected, only that the church may be the gainer in the end, in the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that the end justifies the means. Whoa! This is Hegelian science. Two opposing viewpoints, dyclectic thinking. You war the one with the other, and you rub them up until nothing is left. It's called thesis, antithesis, and the resultant clash brings synthesis, that which you want. Now note that the Jesuit can be very active on the one side, but he can be equally active on the other side. So this is all a process whereby they wish to attain things. The 30-year war, now what was that about? The aim and the object was that that war should in truth become a war of annihilation. Besides, was it possible for them to allow peace to be concluded with countries whose rebellious governments had issued a law ruling that no Jesuit should ever gain dare to show his face? Do you know that the Jesuits were thrown out of virtually all countries, including Catholic ones, because they were so divisive? 
Catholic kings couldn't even take the Jesuits and threw them out. If a Catholic king dared to throw out a Jesuit, that country was destroyed, Catholic or not, and the Jesuits are back. You can take your bottom dollar for that. So, the frightful responsibility for this terrible Thirty Years' War must rest upon the Emperor Ferdinand II and his teachers, rulers, and bosom friends, the sons of Loyola. Every single thing I'm saying is a quote. Popery, an enemy to civil religious liberty. In 1550, Pope Julius declared his claim to universal temporal political power evidenced by a new coin he issued, its motto, having read, the nation and kingdom that will not serve me shall perish. Now please note that this is a Roman Catholic statement that the nation and the kingdom that does not serve the papacy will perish. What does that mean in terms of Protestant countries then? Are they going to be in trouble, yes or no? I would say, yes, they will be in trouble. Thomas Aquinas, the great um, philosopher of the Roman Catholic Church, said, the Pope by divine right has spiritual and temporal power as supreme king of the world. The Pope of Rome as head of the papal government claims absolute sovereignty and supremacy over all the governments of the earth all the governments. All these quotes are highly potent quotes. There is nothing mediocre in these quotes, and they come from the highest, highest sources. The right of deposing kings is, is inherent in the supreme sovereignty which the Pope says vice-region of Christ exercise over all Christian nations. Cardinal Henry Manning, 1892, he was Archbishop of, Man Man of Westminster. So, he is in control of all nations of the world. Now it's interesting that uh, the Bible tells us that these words were put on the Christ's uh, cross at the cru crucifixion. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. You read that in John 19, 19. But the Roman Catholic crucifix has the words Inri written on it. Now, if you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, it means Jesus Nazarenos Rex Euderum. But in the extreme oath of the Jesuits, Inri means something totally different. It means Iustum Necare Reges Impios, which means it is just to exterminate or annihilate impious or heretical kings, governments, or rulers. That's an interesting point. Now, another thing that they want to do is destroy Protestantism. We cherish at the bottom of our hearts this principle that whatever does not unite with us must be annihilated. And we hold ourselves ready to make, as soon as we shall have the means, an energetic application of these principles. Protestantism is already, already wearing out and sinking to decay. Yes, we are destined to insult its last agony to march over its broken skeleton and scattered bones, oh, let us hasten this dissolution by our strong and united efforts. Then already, they wrote, Protestantism is becoming decomposed, and we are gaining men of note. This is extracts from the secret plan. Uh, those are the worst of the Catholics, the Inquisitors, the Jesuits. They are simply the Romish army for the earthly sovereignty of the world in the future with the pontiff of Rome for emperor. Something like a universal serfdom with them as master is what is being planned. That's all they stand for. They don't even believe in God, perhaps, the brothers Karmasov. Uh, all these quotes. The general of the Jesuits insists on being master sovereign over sovereigns. Wherever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be master cost what it may. The society is by nature dictatorial, and therefore it is the irreconcilable enemy of all constituted authority. Fifty years in the Church of Rome, written by Father Chenikin. Ignatius Loyola says himself, the power of the general be, will be so unlimited that should he deem it necessary for the honor of God, he shall even be able to send back, or in another direction, those who have come direct from the popes. So this is a powerful order. Friedrich von Hartenberg said, Never before in the course of the world's history has such a society appeared. 
The old Roman Senate itself did not lay schemes for world domination with greater certainty of success. They want world dominion, with the Pope enthroned as the universal ruler. The Roman Catholic Lafayette said, it is my opinion that it is that if the liberties of this country, the United States of America, are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priests, for they are the most crafty, dangerous enemies to civil and religious liberty. They have instigated most of the wars of Europe. These are prominent people speaking. Morse, he's the founder of the Morse Code, the inventor of the Morse Code. He said, and who are these agents? They are for the most part Jesuits an ecclesiastical order, order proverbial through the world for cunning duplicity and total want of moral principle, an order so skilled in all the arts of deception that even in Catholic countries, in Italy itself, it became intolerable and the people required its suppression. That's another prominent man. Archduke Maximo Francis said, they have so constantly mixed themselves up in the court and state intrigues that they must in justice be reproached with striving of the universal dominion. And we could go on and on and on. This is a very interesting one. This is Michelangelo Tamburni, 1720. This is the Jesuit of the general of the Jesuits, the general speaking to the Duke of Brancas, and he said the following. See, my lord, from this room, from this room, I govern not only Paris, but China. Not only China, but the whole world, without anyone knowing how it is managed. Interesting. This is what the Jesuits themselves had to say. The Pope's confessor has to be a Jesuit. And the Pope himself has to come to a Jesuit to confess. The Vatican Empire, there, all, everything I say is a quote. This here is Jean-Baptiste Janssen. He ruled from 1946 to 1964, and uh, he looks like a charming gentleman, very cheerful. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, you can see that this photograph was taken from the Saturday Evening Post, 1959, and this is what he is in command of. And now we will want to deal with these issues in the next session. He controls the following secret societies. The Sovereign Military Order of Malta. So he is in control of the Knights of Malta. The Scottish Rite Shrine of Freemasonry. The Order of the Illuminati. The Knights of Columbus. The Knights of the Klu Klux Klan. Benai Berit the Nation of Islam and its private army called the Fruit of Islam, the Mafia Commission, Opus Dei, along with a host of lesser brotherhoods. So each one of those secret societies is controlled by the Jesuits. How do they control it? And what is their aim? And who is a member, for example, of the Knights of Malta? Who today is a member of the Knights of Columbus? Who is a member of, of Benai Berit? Who controls the fruit of Islam? Who controls Opus Dei? Who controls Skull and Bones and all the other secret societies? And what is their agenda? That is what we have to find out. Remember that Rome wants to regain total dominion, and if they are the center of Templar theology, then they want to control the world for the dragon, not for Jesus Christ. The dragon gave them their power and their seat and great authority. This is scary. And this power must be in control in your country as well, as in mine. But the good news is that Jesus foretold it we read it in Revelation, and he says, no matter how they confederate, no matter how they scheme, the kingdom is going to go to whom? It's going to go to Jesus. Jesus wins. So there's nothing to be afraid of, but I will show you these secret societies in the next session, and I will show you who the members are.
As we spoke in our previous little session, this is Jean-Baptiste Baptiste Janssen, just one of the great generals of the Society of Jesus. He was the leader from 1946 to 1964. And we mentioned the Order of Malta, the Shriners, the Order of the Illuminati, the Knights of Columbus, Klu Klux Klan, and all these secret societies that are under the control of the Jesuit general. Persecution of the Catholic Church in Germany has been directed only against those elements which did not entirely submit to the ever-increasing centralization of authority in church and state. So sometimes it looks as if even the Catholics are suffering, but only those Catholic groups that are not totally submissive to this system will be subjugated. Some Catholic orders were actually opposed to the Jesuits. They were killed, they were wiped out. In the French Revolution, the Dominicans had taken over the Inquisition from the Jesuits. Boom! They were zapped. And the Jesuits took it back. Its objective was and is still to destroy the effects of the Reformation and to re-establish the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. A greater Germany, in other words, must be made again the center of a revived Holy Roman Empire. Leo H. Lehmann, 1942, an American historian, said that. Isn't it fascinating that the Russian president, or a Russian president, let me put it that way, and many political leaders have given the assurance that Germany will once again play a greater role in the new Europe today. Isn't it also fascinating that it was a Jesuit priest, Father Stempfler, and not Hitler, who wrote Mein Kampf? In fact, you can read it on Mein Kampf itself. Now, the SS used this symbol of the skull and crossbones. What was that a symbol of? Do you remember? It was the symbol of Jupiter, the god Jupiter, the god of death. It's also the symbol of Osiris, who was the god of death. Anubis is just another form of Osiris. He is the god of death. He's the god of the dead. But Jesus says, I am the god of the living. I am not the god of the dead. I'd rather serve the god of the living. The SS was organized by Himmler according to Jesuit order principles. The rules of service spiritual exercises prescribed by Ignatius Loyola constituted a model which Himmler strove carefully to copy. Absolute obedience was the supreme rule. Every order had to be executed without comment. Every single statement is being read from a reputable source. Again, in that wonderful book, The Great Controversy, we get an idea of the Jesuits. Throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created. Notice what this quote says. The most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery, cut off from every earthly tie and human interest, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason, and conscience, wholly silenced, they knew no rule, no tie, but that to their order, and no duty but to extend its power. We don't have to read the whole quote. But they made it their business to destroy Protestantism. The Jesuit order therefore stands before us as the embodiment of a system which aims at temporal political domination, and that over the whole world. You will say to me, Surely China will not be subject. Well, we already wrote, read a quote by the Jesuit general himself where he says he controls China. Who controls communism? The Jesuits created it and therefore they controlled it. They practiced it in their, in their uh, South American examples where they practiced it before they instituted it. Very interesting. This is Count von Hernsbruch, 1911, German noble and ex-Jesuit, who says this very thing. 
At what then do the Jesuits aim? According to them, they seek the greater glory of God. But if you examine the facts, you will find they aim at universal dominion alone. It is they who rule the world. One quote after the other. Moreover, the Pope has thousands of secret agents worldwide. They include the Jesuits, the Knights of Columbus, the Knights of Malta, Opus Dei, and others. The Vatican's intelligence service and its field resources are second to none. Even Dave Hunt, American Baptist historian, says that. So, let's have a look at some of these institutions. Let's have a look at Freemasons. The Grand Design Exposed says, The truth is the Jesuits of Rome have perfected Freemasonry to be their most magnificent and effective tool, accomplishing their purposes among Protestants. Now surely the members of Freemasonry themselves must be deceived because if they saw it they wouldn't do it, right? So actually the order is being used and they themselves are deceived. And only within the order, higher up, are those chosen ones who know, and they are controlled by the Jesuits for Rome. Very clever. Very clever to make Protestantism do what you cannot do openly because you have been fingered by Protestantism as the Antichrist. So this is very interesting. This is a Templar fortress in and, and a church on the island Mallorca, Spain. And there again you have the double-headed eagle, and you can go to virtually any church on that island, and you will find the double-headed eagle over the altars of these churches. As I've said, I, Adam Weishaupt was the father of Jacobinism, and he is the one who is also the founder of the Illuminati. From the Jesuit College at Ingolstadt, it is said to have issued the sect known as the Illuminati of Bavaria, founded by Adam Weishaupt, its nominal founder, however seems to have played a subordinate, though conspicuous, role in the organization of the sect. You see, again, they use a front and a front and a front. Now, here are two Jesuit generals. This one over here is General Ricci, and this is General... Ledokovsky, and very interesting, this one over here, 1773 to 1840, 14, he ruled during the order's suppression. Now notice this, the Vatican itself suppressed the Vatican, uh, the, the Jesuits, between 1773 and 1814. What happened to the Vatican in that time? There was a mortal wound. And the Pope was taken into exile and he died. Isn't that correct? So who gave the mortal wound to the papacy? The own order in the own church. Power struggle. And he created, in his time, the Illuminati was created through Weishaupt. And, of course, is also the father of modern communism, who with his Jacobins conducted the French Revolution. Years later, Jesuit General Ledokovsky, with his Bolsheviks, conducted the Russian Revolution in 1917, and it's identical to the other revolution. And I will deal with that when I give a lecture on revolutions and wars and dictators later in the series. France's greatest authority on the Jesuits, Edmund Paris, said, the Russian Revolution, by eliminating the Tsar, protector of the Orthodox Church, had it not decapitated the great rival and helped the penetration of the Roman Church? We must strike while the iron is hot. The famous Russicum, Russian College of Rome, is created in 1929 and its clandestine missionaries will take the good news to its schismatic country. One century after their expulsion by Tsar Alexander I, the Jesuits will again undertake the conquest of the Slav world. And did the poor Slavic world suffer? They were slaughtered by the millions. History will show what happened there when Stalin, probably one of the greatest mass murderers of all time, did his thing. Frederick the Great, so-called of Prussia, caused the high degrees of Masonic constitutions of the ancient rite to be revived, 
and he himself wrote the constitutions under the guide of the Jesuit general. Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, Albert G. Mackey says that himself. Very interesting. And now notice this. This is a source that's unbelievable. This is Isis Al unveiled by Blavatsky herself, the author of Secret Doctrine. She says that the rites are the offspring of the sons of Ignatius Loyola, the Scottish rite and all of these, worked under the instructions from the general of the Jesuits. So who controls Freemasonry? The Jesuits, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, we have confirmed the induction of the Knights Templar Mason into the councils of the said order of knighthood and hoping in confiding that he will ever be so demean himself as to conduct to the glory of IHS, the most holy and almighty God, and to the honor of the mark we do recommend. There's a ritual in Freemasonry which is totally Jesuit. So the Jesuits control Freemasonry. Here's a Freemason uh, temple, if you like. It's in uh, Oklahoma. There is IHS. This is a Freemason temple. It's a lodge. There is IHS in it. There are still old ladies, male and female, about the country who will tell you with grim gravity that if you trace up masonry through all its orders till you come to the grand tip-top head mason of the world, you will discover that the dread individual and the chief of the society of Jesus are one and the same person. James Patron, American historian. There are many that say these things. Knights of Malta. The Freemasons are in the foreground, while the Jesuits and the Knights of Malta are in the background. The Jesuits control even the Knights of Malta. Now, who are they? Well, they are headquartered in Rome, these knights. They used to be on an island, but besides that, they used to be a military order. They are still a military order. They are knights. They control the banking of the world, the industry of military complexes of the world. They oversee Chase Manhattan Bank with all its branches. They rule all the intelligence communities, the KGB, the CIA, and uh, all of these things to restore the Dark Ages. Everything I'm saying is a quote. I'm saying nothing. Don't accuse me of saying anything. I'm just reading. Who are they? Well, here's the head of the Knights of Malta at the moment in America. This, well, he's dead now. This is Francis Joseph Cardinal Spellman, Cardinals of New York. And their headquarters is St. Patrick's Cathedral, the, arch, uh, the diocese of the Archbishop of New York. So there are the various ones. Here is um, Terence Cardinal Cook. Then was Cardinal O'Connor. And uh, currently Cardinal Archbishop of New York, Edward M. Egan. Now let's have a look who the members of the Knights of Malta are. That should be interesting. Some past, some present. General Alavena, George Anderson, Angleton, Azru, Bertie, Bobs, Bonaparte, does that name ring a bell? Uh, Borghese, Bradley, Brady, Pat Buchanan, does that name ring a bell? James Buckley, Prescott Bush, does that ring a bell? Frank Capra, William Casey, does that ring a bell? CIA, uh, Cisnero, Cooks, Coughlin, Loach, Gistard de Steng, does that ring a bell? President of, the, of France, Bill Donovan, Alan Dulles, Avery Dulles, Edward Egan, that's of course the Cardinal himself, Franz Egon, John Farrell, Flanagan, Flynn, Gelly, Galen, Gorman, Grace, General Alexander Haig, does that ring a bell? Uh, Otto von Habsburg, wow. Conrad Hilton, Heinrich Himmler, he was at Knights of Malta. J. Edgar Hoover, FBI, CIA fame, uh, Joseph Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, Larkin, Lehman, Lorenza, Luce, Henry Luce, founder of all the great magazines and Time magazine and all of them. Great publishing mag magnet, uh, McDonald, Manhattan, you name them, all of them. O'Neill, Otis, von Franz von Papen, the legate who uh, worked with Adolf Hitler, Peron, uh, Rocco, oh, the list goes on and on and on. Frank Shakespeare, Martin Shea, even Frank Sinatra was a Knight of Malta, for interest's sake. So there are prominent men who are Knights of Malta. Now what about the Knights of Columbus? 
The founder of the Knights of Columbus, his father Michael McGivney, he lived a very short time, then he died, he was very young, he died at the age of 38. There is their emblem, and uh, this is their official home webpage, you can just take it straight off, and you can see something fascinating. What is that? Hello? Do you remember what it is? A little bundle of rods that you also found in the French Revolution right there in the Manifest of Human Rights? What is it? Fasciae. And they've got a wreath around them. What does that mean? All power in one man. Who will that man be? Who do the Knights Columbus, founded by a Roman Catholic priest, want to see the power vested in? The Pope, of course. The Knights of Columbus, founded at New Haven, Connecticut, 1882. Uh, it, then it was already considered 300,000 strong. A Roman Catholics are only Roman Catholics are eligible. It is initiative to service in four degrees. It's the heart and soul of politics. You cannot get into politics if you don't have the stamp of approval of these guys. The fact is well known to political machines and non-Catholic politicians whose candidates must receive the approval of Rome and the Knights before they dare nominate them for either dog pound or presidency. The Knights of Columbus' principal business is politics, a Jesuitical politics. A menace to the nations, Jeremiah Crowley, is the quote. These are serious accusations. There they are, with their fasciae, which will become clearer as we go on and we can see where we are heading. For today, Rome considers that, listen to this, today, Rome considers the fascist regime the nearest to its dogmas and interests. We have not merely the reverend Jesuit father Coughlin praising Mussolini's Italy as a Christian democracy, but their official magazine, which is Civita Cattolica, this is the official Jesuit magazine, says, this is the house organ of the Jesuits, says, fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. This is scary. Have you noticed lately that there is more and more control? Have you noticed some of these things? Have you noticed that you are being treated more and more like uh, someone who has to bow 20,000 times before the powers? Then there is the organization Opus Dei, is a semi-secret religious lay order with paramount objective is total support of the papacy. And these people walk around with clamps that tear into their flesh so that they have constant pain with every movement to remind them of their obligation. And they have high, high members like presidents, for example, of Portugal is an Opus Dei member. And then we have the Skull and Bones organization. And who are they? Well, they have this interesting skull and bones. What does it represent? You know that by now. Jupiter. And they have the number 322. If you look up Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, you will find, now man has become as one of, like one of us, knowing good and evil, raising man to the level of deity. This is Yale University, the place where they are. Now let's consult one of the greatest authorities on skull and bones, that is Anthony Sutton, let's ask him who he is, educated at the Universities of London, Gottingen, California, former research fellow at the Hoover Institute, Stanford University, as well as economics professor of California State University. He had the guts to speak out and write a book, and it cost him dearly. But nevertheless, let's quote him. There is the book. Anthony Sutton, America's Secret Establishment, an introduction to the order of skull and bones. So that I don't say it, let's quote it. Skull and bones, it's over, it's Bush. Bush won the election. Let's watch this video. Yale University, the scions of America's first families confess their sexual exploits from a gruesome coffin. In a smoke-filled room, a handful of power brokers manipulate the global economy. These are the purported activities of some of America's secret societies, groups with names like Bilderberg, Skull and Bones, and the Trilateral Commission. 
The Skull and Bones Society is founded in 1832 by 15 seniors at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. They establish a secret society with rules and rituals that remain unchanged to this day. The Skull and Bones initiation ceremony is said to be held in April in the tomb's basement. One distinguished member serves as master of ceremonies. Once enrobed, he is known as Uncle Toby. The shortest senior is appointed Little Devil and dons a satanic costume. A bonesman with a deep voice is dressed as Don Quixote. Another is dressed as the college's founder, Elihu Yale. Still another is given papal vestments. It would all be funny if it weren't for the fact that among the former bonesmen are three presidents. William Howard Taft, George Bush, George W. Bush, numerous senators and ambassadors, industrialists like William Whitney, CIA agents, State Department officials, and publishing magnate Henry Luce. Absolute secrecy is also required. In his 1999 autobiography, George W. Bush devotes just one sentence to his membership in Skull and Bones. Quote, my senior year, I joined Skull and Bones, a secret society so secret, I can't say anything more. The secrecy, according to some researchers, is there to protect the fact that Skull and Bones funnels its initiates into positions of power and influence. The best known Bonesman is ex-president George Bush, who according to tradition, is supposed to avoid admitting he's a member. Mr. President, are you a member of Skull and Bones? American Journal got a similar response when we recently asked George Bush Jr., the governor of Texas, about his membership. Does it still exist? I mean, the thing is so secret, I'm not even sure it still exists. Okay, so you'll see that George W. Bush is a member. They lie in a coffin. They bow down before a papal figure swear allegiance. They do all kinds of weird sexual things in a coffin, which I'm not going to uh, explain what they do here. It's pretty vile. And uh, these are the presidents of the most powerful countries in the world, and they belong to secret societies such as this. So, now, we're soon to have an election, and uh, here is the German newspaper, uh, Financial Times, Deutschland, February 2004, which confirms that uh, Kerry, the opposition leader who is going to stand against George W. Bush, is also a member of Skull and Bones. So really, what's the point in voting if both of them belong to the same camp? What these people believe and what they are all about, we will have to see in one of the next lectures. The order, what it is and how it began, those on the inside know it as the order, others have known it for more than 150 years as chapter 322 of a German secret society. That is very important. In fact, this was discovered when they broke in and stole some of the papers at that uh, institution. It uh, is officially known as the Russell Trust of 1856, or as the Brotherhood of Death, because they serve the God of Death, who happens to be Anubis, if you like, Osiris, if you like, or Jupiter. The American chapter of the German order was founded in 1833 at Yale University by General William Huntington Russell, and uh, Toft, the only man to be both President and Chief Justice of the United States. Interesting. Now, the German order, what does this actually mean? The Illuminati had its origin at the University of Ingolstadt, and recru recruits were from the student in Corps. Of course, they had to be students with high connections, you know, sons of, of uh, very high insiders. The order had its origin in Yale in 1833, but Skull and Bones is a chapter of a German secret society. So, which organization does it represent? Active members have enough influence to push their sons and relatives into the order, and there's significant intermarriage amongst the families, and they fall into major categories, two major categories. We find the old line, American families, 
The second, families who occupy great wealth. When he's initiated into the order, he says, tonight he will die to the world and be born again into the order, as he will henceforth refer to it. The order is a world unto itself in which he will have a new name and 14 new blood brothers also with new names. Now there's also a British chapter which was established at Oxford University and uh, All Souls College, and the British element is called the group. So the Skull and Bones is not the only one. You have the group and then you have a European order as well. So the group links to the Jewish equivalent through the Rothschilds, the inner circle, and uh, so there is a worldwide uh, secret organization which has the highest individual in industry, government, all facets of life. And they actually are the most prominent rulers in the world today, and if they are a chapter of a German society, then they are the Illuminati. And George W. Bush said that there are a thousand points of light illuminating the world at the moment. It's interesting that the order uh, writes many constitutions. The members write constitutions. For example, Archibald MacLeish, who is a member of Skull and Bones, or was, he wrote the constitution of UNESCO. Now we're going to have to deal with UNESCO and find out what it's about. Churches, the Union Theological Seminary is under the control of Skull and Bones. A very interesting seminary. We'll deal with these in more detail in another lecture. Major establishment of law firms, communications and industry, the Federal Reserve, and all of these are controlled by the order. This is how chapter 322 operates. There's a central inner core. Notice that this is actually the all-seeing eye, the wedge of the eye, but that's something else. Uh, there's an inner core, there's an inner circle, there's an outer circle, there's an Atlantic circle, the Bohemian Club. Notice there, Bohemian Club, part of Skull and Bones. Pilgrim Society, Penumbra Order, Chapter 322 of the Order, the Trilateral Commission. That's how it's put together. You could basically put it this way, Council of Foreign Relations, United Nations, Bilderbergs, Club of Rome, Royal Institute of International Affairs, and the Trilateral Commission, with the Illuminati controlling everything on the inside, forming basically the round table. Now you saw that the Bohemian Club is part and parcel of the issue. Now what is this Bohemian Club? Well, here's the Bohemian Grove. The August 2, 1982 edition of Newsweek reported, this is just another quote, the world's most prestigious summer camp, the Bohemian Grove, is now in session 75 miles north of San Francisco. It's in a forest. It's a fortress. But strangely, even fortresses can be breached, and one enterprising journalist managed to sneak in. The fiercely guarded 2,000 acre retreat is the country's extension of San Francisco's all-male, ultra-exclusive Bohemian Club, to which every Republican president since Herbert Hoover have belonged. This is just a quote. This is the Bohemian Grove ceremony, which was photographed or videotaped very darkly, of course, very secretly, by one journalist, which caused a major furor. Now you can see very little in this light, so I'll explain to you what's happening there. In this forest, the men appear naked. Naked. They have to walk around naked. In fact, some members have left the society because they're tired of walking around naked. Now imagine every president of the United States has been a member of the Bohemian Grove. And, you know, just imagine it. The priests are dressed in vestments, papal vestments, and they pay homage to an owl because the owl sees in darkness. It has illumination. They worship nature. They say, beauty surrounds us now and we worship her. This is nature. It's nature worship. And they honor the owl and bow down to it. This is paganism at its worst. There are other rituals which I do not want to talk about that happen between all these naked men. And uh, if you read your Bibles, you will find that those who worshipped in the groves were called the perverted ones. They were 
people of high position and were amongst the highest of society. And periodo periodically a good king came along and cleaned up, but then they always came back into power. This is nature worship, this is pan worship, this is Luciferian worship, and the presidents of the world are members. Let's look at the Bohemian Grove video. There's the paper now vest. Now is in his leafy temple, that all within the grove be reverent before him. Lift up your heads, O ye trees, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting choirs. For behold, here is Bohemian shrine, and holy are the pillars of this house. There's the owl. For beauty is eternal, and we bow to beauty everlasting. For lasting happiness, we turn to one alone, and she surrounds you now. Great natures, refuge of the weary heart. We bow to one alone, great nature. She is ever faithful. Other friends may fail, so must he come as children. Little children that believe or ever doubt her beauty and her faith. Bohemians and priests, our funeral fire awaits the corpse of care. Prince and of all mortal wisdom. Owl of Bohemia, we beseech thee, grant us thy counsel. Owl of Bohemia, grant us thy counsel. Well, that's just a part of the ritual, which shows that it is nature worship. It is condemned in the Bible, and yet, who are the members? Let's continue. This is an article in Mother Jones, August 18, 1981, volume 6, page 28, and reports who the prominent members were. For example, George P. Schultz, Stephen Betchold, uh, Gerald Ford, Henry Kissinger, William Buckley. Can you imagine them all walking around naked, worshipping a stupid owl? I mean, that's so pathetic. <laughs> Fred Hartley, Griffin, Haywood, Coors, Teller, Ronald Reagan, Clausen, George Bush, William French, Smith, etc., etc., etc. It is pathetic. Modus operandi of the order. The activities of the order are directed towards changing our society, changing the world, to bring about a new world order. This will be a planned order with heavily restricted individual freedom. That's fascism. And I will show you the papal encyclicals that will make your hair stand on edge as to what is going to happen all over the world. And believe me, I live in a country where it's being implemented. And you can see it happening every single day. It is scary. But you don't have to be afraid. If you know why it's happening, if you do not know why it is happening, you will despair and there are thousands who are putting bullets through their head because they cannot tolerate it. 4,000 farmers driven off the land and murdered in my country alone. They lose everything, they lose hope, they put bullets through their heads, they wipe out their entire families because it's better for them to die than to live with it. And you know what? You give a lecture like this and you show what's behind it and why it's behind it, and guess what? They get hope. Because they see it's not just them and not something they don't understand. Once they start understanding the bigger picture, they gain hope. And they say, wow, so it's not really the end for us because this is simply the sign that Jesus is coming soon and there will be a better kingdom let us give our lives to Jesus Christ because this world has nothing to offer. And they get hope. So far than being negative, they conceive a lecture like this, for example, as positive. And it has an amazing effect on countries where this is being implemented this very day. 
No constitutional protection if you go against it. They control education. I'll show you how in the lectures. Money, law, politics, economy, history, psychology, philanthropy, medicine, religion, media. There is nothing that they do not control. And remember, they are neither left nor are they right. So if there are right-wing parties and left-wing parties, they control them what? Both. That's the Hegelian principle. That's Hegelian logic. Remember that both Marx and Hitler, the extremes of left and right, presented as textbook enemies, evolved out of the same philosophical system, Hegelianism. I'm quoting from one of the greatest researchers in this field that brings screams of intellectual anguish for Marxists and Nazis. Remember that the, not, that the, the uh, Jesuits were told that they must serve on this side and the other side. Remember that? And create conflict between the sides. This conflict of opposites is essential to bring about the change that they want. Today this process can be identified in the literature of the Trilateral Commission, for example, where change is promoted under conflict management. Have you heard that name before? Right, conflict is essential. The state is absolute, so the state must have total control. That means the people must relinquish their rights to the state. Do you see that happening in the United States at the moment? Absolutely. So, the state requires complete ob obedience. An individual does not exist for himself in these so-called organic systems, but only to perform a role in the operation of the state. That's exactly what it was like under Nazism. Here's Hegel. The two, Hegel and Kant, are the philosophers behind the system. I was stunned. I was in Europe four weeks ago, in Germany, and the leaders, the presidents of Germany, went down and put down wreaths in front of these people's graves and said, their philosophy has made the new Europe possible. They honored them. What a terrible, I would almost say satanic, well, why not just say it, philosophy. The Illuminati principle that the end justifies the means is also the principle of the group and the order, which is skull and bones. That means you can do anything, no matter how dastardly, as long as you achieve your aim. There's an outer circle, an inner circle, an inner core, all of these, Council of Foreign Relations is the Outer Circle, Trilateral Commission, all of those. Uh, Trilateral Commission was founded by David Rockefeller, comprises 200 members worldwide. The Bundy Operation, uh, activism towards a new world global order. George W. Bush, who was a member of Skull and Bones, remember, says that he's a big idea, a new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in a common cause only the United States has both the moral standing and the means to back it up. So, do you think they're trying to get all the countries of the world to come into this system, yes or no? Do you think it's possible that they are giving their power to a woman who rides them? Does it look like it? Who controls them? The Jesuits. And who do the Jesuits say all power must be under? The Pope. Isn't that correct? All right, so who do you think would clamor for a new world order more than anyone else? Maybe the Pope. Wouldn't that be interesting? Well, here he is. New international order urged for the sake of peace. When? January 3, 2004. His whole New Year's speech was dedicated to asking for the implementation of the New World Order. The Vatican City, January 1, 2004. John Paul II started the New Year by insisting that peace is possible, and thus a duty, and he called for a new international order. CNN, what did that have to say? Pope calls for a New World Order. Thursday, January 1, 2004. Vatican City, Pope John Paul rang in the New Year on Thursday with a renewed call for peace in the Middle East and Africa and the creation of a new world order 
based on respect for the dignity of man and equality amongst nations. What did he say? This year, Pope John Paul directed his thoughts to the continuing conflict around the globe, but he stressed that to bring about peace, there needs to be a new respect for international law and the creation of a new international order based on the goals of the United Nations. He called for an order that is able to give adequate solutions to today's problems based on the dignity of the human being, this is human rights, on an integral development of society, on solidarity amongst nations, rich and poor, on the sharing of resources and the extraordinary results of scientific and technical process. You know, sharing of resources. Have you heard of that before? Well, there's another term for it. It's called redistribution of wealth. Have you heard of that before? Right. Now, let me redefine that for you. To redistribute wealth means to take the wealth from the one who has it and give it to one who has not got it. Is that correct? Now, if you do that, which nations of the world will be hardest hit? The Catholic ones or the Protestant ones? The Protestant ones are the rich nations. Everywhere you can draw a line. Now I will show you in the lectures that come that there are encyclicals which define how the redistribution is to take place. And how it is happening and how the encyclical says it should take place is what I can see happening in my country without the government lifting a finger against it. It is defined by need, as we will see. Now, there's another word for taking from one who has and distributing it to someone who does not have. It's called theft. <laughs> Stealing. Thou shalt not steal says the Bible. The Pope in Rome says, thou shalt steal. He does. Literally, I'll show you his encyclical, you will be stunned. This new world order is going to be an exciting place. I don't want much part of it. Fortunately, my God says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, they would fight for me, but it is not of this world. My kingdom is up there. There where your treasure is, there your heart will be. I have managed, because I live where I live, to loosen myself from that which I own, because I know that it means nothing anymore. Do you know that in my country, if you go on a holiday, and you stay away for a while and you come back and your house is occupied that you cannot put the new tenants out even if the house is yours? Did you know that? Because they have need, therefore they have the right to take it whether you own it or not. And this is not a joke, this is a fact. It's scary. But who cares? I serve a God who has promised the most wonderful things, even temporal things, to those who serve him. Wonderful promises. I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again to take you where I am also. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go. Actually, it doesn't mean rooms, it means mansions. God has prepared things for us which make this world sick by comparison. So let them have their kingdom, let them have their fun, because my God says this world will come to an end and the kingdom of God will reign forever and ever and ever. Don't miss the next lectures. We're now on a roller coaster ride that will take you to exciting places. Thank you for coming.